Today on Inside Utah Politics, Representative Celeste Malloy joins us. Hear her takeaways from a recent trip to the front lines in Ukraine. State leaders spar over Constitutional Amendment D, how the battle lines are being drawn with less than two months until the big vote. Counting down the hours to the presidential debate on ABC4, how the Trump and Harris campaigns are setting the tone ahead of their first formal showdown. Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Brian McElhatton. Let's go inside Utah politics right now. And we begin today less than two months out from the November general election. It's coming up fast. But for one race, the primary lasted a little longer than anyone expected. Bogged down in recounts and court battles. We told you about all those. That was the race for the Congressional District 2 Republican nomination. And I'm joined today by Utah Representative Celeste Malloy. She represents District 2. Congresswoman, thanks for being with us. We appreciate it. It's good to be here. And listen, so much to talk about. So let's dive in. Okay. Uh, you won, of course, won that special election. And yes. then within months, you within shifted. Within weeks. Weeks, you shifted into campaign mode and had to defend defend that seat. Yep. Tell us what that was like and walk us through the process. Yeah, um, I've had other politicians tell me that politics is a fantastic spectator sport, but it's a garbage participant sport. <laughs> and I see now what they mean. Um, these close races are exciting to watch, but they're, they're tough to be in. And that special, everything happened really fast. I hadn't spent a lot of my life planning on running for Congress. I'm still really grateful to be where I am. But to go through that special, and it was actually four weeks from when I got sworn in until I filed to run again. Just four weeks. Just yeah. four weeks. And Christmas was in there somewhere and New Year's. So um, it's, been, it's been a really long, prolonged campaign because there was never really a break between the two. So I've basically been campaigning for 15 months. And I was a rookie 15 months ago, and now I feel like I'm a hardened pro. Um, I've, I've earned my stripes. Nothing like jumping into the water and just yeah. getting started, right? That's yeah. the best way to go about it. And you were telling me before we began recording, you know, what it's like as a representative. You've served in Washington before in a different capacity. You worked, yeah. you know, as a staffer. Mm -hmm. Now you're the elected representative, and that's yeah. a completely different ballgame. It is. Every time I see Chris Stewart, I tell him that I apologize for all the things I didn't understand as a staffer that he was dealing with. Because when you work in a congressional office, you, you think you sort of know everything that's going on. I, I felt like I was really proficient at what I did and, and had a finger on the pulse of the office, but I didn't deal with the political side at all. And now as a member, I deal with both. And I realize now how much my former boss was doing that just happened outside of my frame of vision. Yeah. Now I'm doing all of it, and it, it takes some stamina. Sure, it, I'm sure it does. i got to ask you about Colby Jenkins. Okay. Campaigning for recounts. We had some issues with ballots and postmarking. Those ballots had to leave rural Utah, yeah. go through Las Vegas, yep. come back to Utah. Yeah. I know a lot of voters were frustrated by that process. Yeah. Do you think the federal government has a role to play in improving the Postal Service's process here? <laughs> well, yeah. The Post Office is the federal government. I mean, this is something the Constitution actually says the federal government should be doing. So we can't get rid of the Post Office. But I've been working on postal issues for years. Um, they've tried to close a lot of the rural post offices. And in those really small towns, the Post Office is the heart of the community. That's where people gather. And having to drive 20 miles to pick up your mail or having it delivered to a mailbox just isn't the same. And so I've been working for a long time on trying to get the post office to offer better service in rural Utah. And there's a part of me, elections aside, that's glad to see other people talking about this now. Glad to see a spotlight on this issue that we're not necessarily getting great postal delivery service in southern Utah. I've had constituents reach out and say, you know, by the time they can get their mortgage, paperwork, write a check, mail it back, it's already late. And I know a lot of people do things like that online now, but not everybody does. And you should be able to get things through the mail in a timely manner. So I'm hoping that some of this attention that's focused on it will give us some momentum to get some of these problems fixed. Got to ask you about Ukraine. Okay. Recently back from that country, you yes. met with President Zelensky. I did. You had to shelter from Russian missiles. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about that. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you take away? So I think the reason I was invited on this trip is because I did not vote for the Russia supplemental 
aid package, or Russia, I'm sorry, Ukraine supplemental aid package. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. <laughs> and so they invited me and several other members of Congress to go see on the ground how they're using the aid and how they're accounting for the dollars. Because I've said, I think we need to support Ukraine, but I'm more comfortable sending them weapons and tech and bullets than I am sending them cash. Cash is too fungible and I don't think they're accountable enough. You supported sending funds to Israel and yeah. allies in the Indo-Pacific, yeah. but not Ukraine. We have a very different relationship with Israel. They're much more accountable. They have a plan. They tell us what they're going to do with everything we send them and they share intel with us. You know, we're sharing information and equipment back and forth. They're one of our strongest allies in the world. Um, Ukraine's in a little different position. They're not a NATO country. Um, we didn't have a great relationship with Ukraine before Russia invaded them. And I just want to be really cautious. I want Ukraine to win. I don't want Russia to get away with, you know, rolling over their neighbors. But I think I have a responsibility as an elected representative to be really careful with tax dollars that are coming from people in my district. And I just want to make sure that I hold them accountable for how they're using it. And going on that trip was part of that accountability. And we met with the U.S. Embassy there, and they outlined really clear goals. And those goals were mostly about accountability and making sure that U.S. taxpayers know how their resources are being spent there. And I, it is better than I thought it was. I'm still not sure how I feel about sending them any more aid, and I know they're going to come back and ask for more. Yeah. So you, you see that the, you said the accountability um, matrix, I guess, is looking better. Yes. Than it was. Yeah, they have an Office of Inspector General team on the ground in Ukraine accounting for where every dollar goes. What else do you think Ukraine would need to do to win your support for sending money? I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you on that, and I don't want to give you a made up answer. It's something that I'm still working on and thinking through. Like I say, I want Ukraine to be successful in this war. Ukraine and er, Russia invaded Ukraine. Ukraine is defending itself. Um, and I think there are a lot of things we can do to support them besides cash. And what the right mix of that is, I'm still figuring out. I'm talking to my colleagues who've also been there and other people who are experts on that region. And I'm not at the point yet where I have a definitive answer. But it's something I'm taking really seriously. I'm putting time and effort into because that's what I owe to the people of Utah. Do you think Ukraine, it is made clear that its goal is to eventually join NATO. NATO has made overtures to Ukraine. Will you support eventual uh, ascension to NATO ally status? I don't know. I wouldn't right now. They're not ready right now. But when I was there, they didn't talk about joining NATO. They spent all of their time talking about joining the EU. And right now they're trying to uh, meet European standards so that they can join the EU. They want to be culturally more European than Soviet. Uh, the older generations grew up Soviet, and it's a big cultural shift for them. And one of the things that we went and saw was their anti-corruption efforts. It's something President Zelensky ran on, and it's something, frankly, that Utahns ask me about whenever we're talking about Ukraine. And we met with the prosecutors who are prosecuting corruption. We met with the people who are screening judges they're going through all their judges, and some of the judges have just said, you know, we're corrupt, we're not going to go through the screening process, we're just going to resign. And it's something I think as Americans, it's hard for us to imagine what it's like to be in the middle of a system that has tolerated a lot of corruption for a long time sure. and try to root that out and clean it up. And they're making a really great effort at that, and I support that, but they're not ready yet. Let me ask you about energy. Okay. Tell me about the FREE Act yeah. that you introduced and what it aims to do. So the, the FREE Act is an attempt to get rid of a lot of the bureaucracy and red tape that's involved in getting government permits. And because, especially in Utah, we have so much federal land, most of the things our local governments are doing require federal permits. I mean, there's a federal agency that regulates almost everything we do, so we have to do all these permits, but especially when all of our land is managed by the government. And a lot of times there aren't time limits on how long it takes them to respond to a request for a permit, and there aren't clear guidelines for what it takes to get a permit. And so it can drag on and on and on. It gets really expensive for taxpayers and really frustrating for everybody involved. And as we've all seen, inflation happens and projects get more expensive if you drag them on and on. Uh, it's just not a good use of taxpayer resources to have our own government getting in the way of infrastructure projects and local planning. 
So what the FREE Act does is tell agencies to go look at the types of permits they issue and which ones could be done as a permit by rule, where they say this is what's required to get a permit. And if you bring us these things, then you get your permit. And it sets some timelines. That could save a lot of local tax dollars and federal tax dollars if we could just have these processes sped up. We're not trying to cut any corners. This isn't even an attempt to change what their requirements are, just to line them out and put some timelines on it so we're not dealing with this bureaucracy and foot dragging and red tape that makes projects expensive in time and money. Well, you mentioned it, uh, federal government, public land, and the state, and where yeah. those things intersect. Yeah. As you know, Utah is suing the federal government right now mm -hmm. over control of millions of acres yep. of public land. What, what does a positive relationship look like between Utah and the federal government? What would you like to see? I would like to see Utahns have more control over the resources inside of our borders. So right now, a lot of our resources are on federal land. And we don't have long-term predictability. I, it's not just that we don't control them. That's bad enough. But we don't even have long-term predictability about how the federal government's going to manage them. So you'll get one president who creates a national monument, another president that shrinks the monument Bears to a smaller ears. size, and, and Grand Staircase yes. Escalante National Monument in my district. And, and the ping-ponging back and forth isn't good for Americans either. And the problem is that the executive branch is too strong. It's out of balance with the legislative and judicial branches. And so what we need is Utahns to have a bigger voice in this. And one of the ways we can do that, the state's suing to get a lot of that land turned over to the state. But also with the Chevron case being overturned, that changes the balance of power between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And as a member of the legislative branch, this is an opportunity for me and my colleagues to reclaim some of the jurisdiction that we have ceded to the executive branch and do things through Congress where you have to convince a lot of people that something's a good idea in order to get it done. And then it has some long-term staying power instead of things bouncing back and forth based on who's in the White House. I want to ask you about Senator Mike Lee. Okay. He, at the convention, the state convention, he pulled a surprise and he endorsed Colby Jenkins. Yeah. And you at the time had said, hey, that was a surprise. I don't have uh, an opinion on that yet. Yeah. That was what you told our cameras. Have you had time to reflect on that? And have you spoken to him since? I have had a little time to reflect on that, yes. I have spoken to him. Um, he shook my hand and congratulated me on my win. We're going to move forward and be part of the same delegation. The Utah voters chose me. They also chose him. So we're going to work together and do what's best for Utah. That's our job. What I hear you saying is that's water under the bridge now. Yeah. We're going we're to move forward. Yep. Um, so tell me about what your first full term in Congress would look like and what you're hoping to accomplish. Uh, what I'm hoping to accomplish is some of what I've already talked about. I would like to see a lot of that federal bureaucracy and the regulatory state peeled back. I think the judicial branch has signaled they're on board for that, and I think a lot of the legislative branch is signaling they're ready for it too. And restoring that balance between the three branches, we're supposed to jealously guard our jurisdiction from each other. I don't think we've been jealous enough in the legislative branch for the last few decades. I would like to see us passing legislation that restores that balance, that makes it clear that agencies don't write, enforce, and interpret their own regulations. They have to do what Congress said. Um, I think Americans win when that happens. So that's one of my big priorities. I also want to take on mandatory spending. I've talked to some of my colleagues about what ideas they have and how we can work together on that. Um, and I want to be involved in the water conversations. Those are really important conversations in Utah, in the West. And states have jurisdiction over water. Part of what I want to do is make sure the federal government isn't overreaching and getting involved in things states should be doing. But there is a federal nexus, especially with interstate waters, and I want to be involved in making sure we have good water policy. That's essential for the future of the West. In the short time we have left, what's been your biggest surprise about working as an elected representative so far? I always get asked that, and depending on my mood, I give different answers. But one of the biggest surprises, and a happy surprise, has been how rewarding it is to work with other members of Congress. I know Congress as a body gets a bad rap. Uh, yeah, you low approval hate ratings. each other, you don't, you don't do anything, you disagree all yeah. the time, right? No, the, the members of Congress that I know, there are 438 of us, I don't know everybody, but the members I know are the kind of people you would love to go to lunch with. Fascinating people. I may not agree with them all the time, but the way other members of Congress have been willing to go out of their way, make sure I know what I'm supposed to do, make sure my staff has the support they need, is. It's been wonderful, and I think most Americans would be really reassured about the future of this country if they could see what it's actually like when members of Congress 
are interacting with each other. It's just not as ugly as it looks on the news. Okay, that's encouraging. Yeah. We'll wait for the reality show. I guess that's called C-SPAN, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's boring and nobody watches it because we're being nice. <laughs> very good. Representative Malloy, thanks so much. It's been good to talk Thank with you. you, and I hope we'll have you on again. Sure. Thank you very much. Hey, still ahead here on Inside Utah Politics, the state auditor is done looking into the primary election. What conclusions he reached after weeks of controversy over those signatures? Right now, lawmakers are working to avoid a government shutdown at the end of the month, and already they're fighting over the terms of a plan to keep the government open. Our Washington correspondent, Vinay Simlot, explains the new wrinkle in the big spending fight. Congress has less than a month before a possible government shutdown, and to avoid it, House Republicans want to force Democrats to take up a bill to prevent non-citizens from voting. You're voting in a federal election. You got to prove you're a citizen. This is not hard. Texas Representative Chip Roy pushed the House Speaker to combine a spending bill with the SAVE Act. It requires documents to prove a person is a citizen before they can register to vote. We make it easy, no burden, but, but we ought to go through that to make sure there aren't non-citizens voting. In July, the White House released a statement opposing that legislation, arguing it is already illegal for non-citizens to vote in federal elections, and the bill would make it much harder for all eligible Americans to register to vote. A person familiar says Speaker Mike Johnson will tie the SAVE Act to a spending plan before it goes to the Senate, where Democrats are in control. Senator, over the... Senate and say, all right, guys, you know, what do you want to do? The SAVE Act is the first hang up. The second, some Republicans want to pass a temporary spending bill through March, hoping former President Donald Trump will win the election. That's not good for anybody. It's bad governance. But the Republican House Appropriations Committee chairman Tom Cole said in July he opposed waiting until next year. Most Democrats agree with him. Well, I would recommend let's get our work done by the end of the calendar year. The divided Congress has until September 30th to resolve two key differences as the government moves closer to a shutdown. In Washington, I'm Vinay Simlot. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy will not appear on the Utah presidential ballot after all. A few weeks ago, Kennedy announced that he would suspend his campaign in certain battleground states and endorse former President Donald Trump. But that has been a struggle for the RFK campaign, with states like Wisconsin and Michigan ruling that he would have to stay on the ballot. Now, this is something of a full-circle moment for the campaign. Utah was the first state to allow Kennedy onto the ballot. Utah's political leaders are sparring right now over the text of the ballot initiative on the constitutional amendment reforming the initiatives themselves. The text of Amendment D asks if the state constitution should strengthen the initiative process by prohibiting foreign influence and clarifying the voters' and legislature's ability to amend laws. Now, the director of the Utah Democratic Party responded to that text by saying this, absolutely deceptive language by the Utah GOP. They ought to be embarrassed, but I know Schultz and Adams have no shame. He's referring in part there to the fact that by statute, House Speaker Mike Schultz and Senate President Jay Stewart Adams write the texts of these types of ballot questions themselves. Riverton Senator Dan McKay responded by saying, I wonder if those that complain about the language on the ballot know they're making the legislature's case. Initiatives mostly pass fail because very busy voters only read what's on the ballot and do not read the actual language. The voters will weigh in on this amendment in November. We are days away from a showdown on the debate stage. On Tuesday, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump go head to head. Our Washington, D.C. correspondent Hannah Brandt has a preview of this. The presidential candidates are trading attacks out on the campaign trail. As we fight to move our nation forward, Donald Trump 
intends to pull us back to the past. Kamala Harris has failed you. She has failed as vice president. But next week, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump will face off in person on the debate stage. At this point, the race looks like it's kind of 50-50. I think both candidates have a ton to lose from this debate. Political science professor Todd Belt points out the last debate had huge consequences. One debate actually cost the nominee their entire campaign. And people are wondering, could this happen again? Going into the debate, the stakes are high as both candidates try to move the needle in this really competitive race. Harris obviously has the momentum. Donald Trump is trying to turn it around. It's anybody's election, and this could be a really critical event. It remains to be seen whether this debate will give voters new insight into key issues and where the candidates stand on them. It's up to the moderators to really hold these candidates' feet to the fire so that they can tell people what would an America look like under their leadership. But Belt says a lot of voters likely won't watch the entire debate. That's why the candidates are always trying to get that good zinger or something that's going to be repeated over and over after the debate, because that's when most people form their opinions of actually what happened. The debate is set for September 10th at 9 p.m. Eastern on ABC News. It'll be in Philadelphia, but there will not be a live audience. In Washington, I'm Hannah Brandt. And thank you, Hannah. That debate will be right here on ABC4 this week. We'll bring it to you live at 7 p.m. Mountain Time next Tuesday. And immediately afterwards, we'll be joined by a live panel of political experts ready to weigh in on how those candidates performed. Our local coverage, that special, will begin at 9 o'clock. We hope to see you then. Coming up here on IUP, a new law aims to get more water to the Great Salt Lake. How recent action from the legislature could see billions of gallons a year flow into that lake. watching Inside Utah Politics. We turn now to a major deal to send billions of gallons of water to the Great Salt Lake. Utah Forestry Fire and State Lands is in negotiations now with a local company to help the lake stay healthy and avoid some bigger problems down the line. R.K. Gardner has the story of how a new state law is helping to make that happen. Compass Minerals has been working on the shores of Great Salt Lake for five decades, and today they've officially signed an agreement to donate 65.5 billion gallons of water back to the lake every year. Compass Minerals and the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands officially signed the agreement. It's a great feeling. It's a partnership. Um, it's really a commitment to Great Salt Lake. And this has been something that's been hard conversations with both sides, but something that's very rewarding in the end once it's finally done. Our, our lifeblood is the lake. And so as much as you want to protect the lake for the state, we want to protect it for our business. The 65 and a half billion gallons is roughly enough water to fill Causey, Echo, Pineview, Lost Creek, and Rockport reservoirs. That's almost every reservoir on the Weber uh, system. This all coming together after the passage of House Bill 453. You're looking at several legislative sessions hours and hours, years of work to get to this point. Under the bill, if the lake's water levels return to the record lows of three years ago, it'll pull an emergency trigger. In that case, the state may curtail or prohibit mineral or element production that results in a net depletion of water. This basically means that the state could shut down mineral extraction companies that rely on the lake for up to two years as a way to save water. And we're not done yet. The Great Salt Lake is still going to require significant effort to save. It's going to require significant policy adjustments to improve. But we have done something incredibly wonderful and substantive today. Those same companies can now donate their water rights to make sure that the maximum volume of water makes it to the lake. During good years, they can use all their water shares and send their excess to the lake. During bad water years, they will reduce their water use or cut it off altogether if the lake reaches critical levels, avoiding state intervention. If the lake drives up, they lose their business. So by doing it this way, it makes sure that in good years, there's more for them. In bad years, there's more for the lake. State leaders say they are working with other companies in hopes 
minerals. They'll follow Compass Minerals' lead. This is real water rights that they're donating in order to have a better uh, situation on the lake, and that's, that's something that comes with cost on their end, and I truly appreciate their willingness to engage to, to really serve this positive purpose of the Great Salt Lake. Everyone I spoke to today said the same thing, that the race to save Great Salt Lake is a marathon and not a sprint, so it will take many similar donations over the course of a few years to really ensure the lake's future. Reporting from Farmington, Kate Garner, ABC4 News. Stay with us, everybody. More Inside Utah Politics coming up right after this. that does it for today's Inside Utah Politics. Don't forget, if you have any local political stories you'd like to see, make sure to reach out. You can email InsideUtahPolitics at ABC4.com. You can also follow along with me on social media. On X, find me at Brian Reports, and on Instagram, just search for Brian McElhatton. And find ABC4 on social media to follow along no matter where you are. And while you're at it, download the ABC4 News app. Headlines in your pocket wherever you happen to be. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. We'll see you right back here next week.